Hello. This is a message. This is a, it's not a message. This is a um, PowerPoint that I've created or I'm creating for the Intro to Theology class on the lecture on Soren Kierkegaard's Works of Love. So I encourage you to read over the book. Um, uh, there's a little bit of an intro. You can take a look at the first few minutes, first maybe 15 minutes of this, and then look over the book. Uh, I mean, look over the book now. Look over what the table of, of contents says. Look over the questions uh, that I've asked you in the populi. And then also um, take 15 minutes, listen to what I have to say. That's kind of an introduction. Then maybe pause this and reread the, the material. Um, that I've asked you to read from the works of love, which is which is not a lot of it, but some of it that focuses on his emphasis upon the different aspects of what it means to love in a Christian way um, when love is a duty, is a Christian duty, and what Christian love then means as opposed to romantic love. So he's going to make a big distinction between the two, although some are, might argue that they're that they're similar. So I encourage you to reflect upon, uh, to understand what he's saying, but also I encourage you to reflect upon what it is you believe and your experience and what are your core, how it relates to your core claims or your core values um, about what it means to be human uh, and or what it means to be um, a person who is following Christianity. So let's begin. So I have a PowerPoint here uh, that I'd like to share. No, that's not it. This is it. Perhaps it. Yes. So this is Works of Love by Soren Kierkegaard. I have one book. Uh, there are a couple different versions of it. I've asked you mostly to read the this one, which is, um, let's see. Hang on just a second. I think it's the Harper version. Um, whereas I'm going to actually quote um, for uh, in the introduction from the Hong version. And the Hong version costs a lot more money. And so I did not um, ask you to purchase that. And it also uh, is easier for um, for folks uh, that the, the photocopying has been made from the Harper as well, because some folks... Uh, have bought the whole book and are reading the whole book in a different context. So let's let's begin. Uh, just as an introduction, Soren Kierkegaard, who is the author, is a Danish philosopher. He's also, uh, since he's from Denmark in the 19th century, he's very influenced by the Lutheran tradition, um, the, the Reformation tradition. He's born on May 5th, which makes him a Taurus. And he is early part of the 19th century in Denmark. He's engaged in a, a time um, in which there's a lot of conflict and uh, he has a lot of critical relationship, critical critique to have of the church, of the Danish church at the time, which is the Lutheran church. Um, and he wrote about several things. Some of you maybe are familiar with him. Some of you may have taken his, uh, courses that have talked about him philosophically, in which he talks a lot about uh, meaning and what does it mean to be human. And uh, he's known as the father of modern existentialism, asking the question about, so existentialism very briefly is, notion that we are the essence of who we are is what we're becoming as opposed to something that's already given that we're trying to live into so that might that's going to impact the way that you think about what your core values are and what it means to be human are you trying to live into a um, norm of what it means to be you or are you creating that norm as you're going, which is changing and growing as you live and experience and decide different uh, paths? And that changes who you are, changes what your values are, uh, hopefully in improving and increasing and enhancing those things. He also wrote about faith and love. 
and despair and anxiety. Uh, he believes that the human person is made up of a com complexity of different spheres of existence, that we live with different norms or different ways of being in the world, depending on our context and depending on our mature spiritual maturity level. He talks about truth as subjectivity, which is not meaning that you get to make up your own truth, but rather truth and that which is most significant really has a lot to do with how you relate to yourself. Are you honest with yourself? Do you have integrity with yourself? How do you um, engage with who you've been in the past and who you want to be in the future? And how do you bring together the different aspects and elements of yourself? Uh, he also wrote a book called Purity of Heart. Purity of Heart is to will one thing, which is about willing the good or willing what it is that God wants us to be. Um, he wrote under his own name, but he also wrote under a lot of colorful pseudonyms, which was more common in that time than it is in our time. Um, but his pseudonyms are not simply a pseudonym of one person's name that he writes under. As many people write under pseudonyms today, you know, they might write serious work under their own name and then sort of fiction or romance under a different name. That's not what he's doing. He's actually playing with the, the pseudonymous names that he creates. And he creates a whole uh, really kind of personhood of the different, what he calls his authorship. The different pseudonyms are almost um, aspects of his self that he's trying out. What's it like to be this kind of self? What's it like to be that kind of self? Um, he defines faith as willing to become oneself as transparently as one is transparently grounded upon the power of God or the power that constitutes you. Willing to become yourself, willing to become oneself, oneself holding all the different elements and parts of the self together and, and not just willing like, oh, I want to be that, but doing what it is you can in your power. So will is a little different than simply wanting. Willing is, I have willpower to do this. Uh, so willing to bring all the aspects of oneself together, even if they're, I mean, not, not to smush them together and make them into something singular, but rather to, to claim all of them and to know, you know, how do we relate these different aspects of yourself, the different ways in which you are in the world to bring all of those together. And that is really only possible as one is, he believes, as one is transparently grounded, grounded and, and transparent um, in the sense that God knows all and that you are aware that God knows all and that God is able then to shine through you transparently grounded upon the power that constitutes you, which is, which is God. Going forward, he, he sees life as this struggle to do that, to basically relate oneself to oneself, to do that in a conscious way, holding together the tensions and ambiguities of life that are internal and external, the ways you relate to yourself internally, the ways you think about yourself internally, and the way you relate with others and who you are when you relate with others. Are you one way when you go to a party and there's lots of fun people in a different way when you're by yourself writing on your journal? Are you one way when you work? Are you a different way with your friends? How do you bring those things together? He's not saying you shouldn't be, but he's saying, how do you hold those things together, both in the creative tension, but also let make sure that they're, they're impacting each other in some way. Now, to begin with the book, this book is called Works of Love and is written in his own authorship. So it's written, as he says, as part of his Christian authorship. And he call, talks about um, the beginning of the book as a work of Christian deliberations. Now, your book says Christian reflections. And um, there's nothing wrong with Christian reflections. There's nothing wrong with that um, translation. Um, I like deliberations um, better because I think it engages us, particularly for the work that we're doing here in System and in Intro to Theology, because what we're talking about in uh, our 
discussion about embedded theology versus deliberative theology speaks to the deliberations, what we deliberate upon, what we are deliberate in what it is we choose to believe and claim as our core values, rather than merely accepting what we've been shaped to believe or claim, either by our parents or our peers or our culture or the cultural norms or whatever is the hot topic of the last couple of years, which is often what um, people follow what's been hot uh, the last couple of years. And they all, we all seem to follow along as Kierkegaard says, like a, like the crowd. And he is, he has much disdain for the crowd. He wants us to be individuals that make our, our own decisions deliberatively with conscious intention and reflection upon what our values are, what the world is doing and saying, how we want to behave and who we want to be and become. Um, I go on to talk, he goes on to talk about, to highlight the ways that the, the work, the, the book, the work in this book, Works of Love, is, uh, on love are not on love per se, but on the works of love. And let me read part of this to you. Uh, yours says a little is a little bit differently. So this would be the preface. So for you, it says these are Christian reflections, which are the fruit of much reflection. Here he says these are Christian deliberations, which are the fruit of much deliberation. And they'll be understood slowly. So he's he's recognizing that as you read this, it's harder to understand than simply a novel or than perhaps some of the other um, theology that we've been reading, which is one of the reasons why I have cut um, the material I'm asking you to read really by half so that you're really more than half, so that you're really focused on just the main points that he's making. If you decide that you, this is something you really want to read more of, there's more to read in the book that will give you a lot more details um, and help you deliberate more fully or deeply. I bring uh, your attention to, this, the, to the, the preface, the uh, starting of the second paragraph. These are Christian deliberations. Therefore, they are not merely about love, such as poetic love, but are about the works of love. And love, the works of love, is about action and concrete engagement with the other, not merely feelings. These are the works of love, not as if hereby all its works were now added up to des and described, oh, far from it. So he's saying this is not all of the works of love, even though this is a pretty thick book. He hasn't gotten to all the ways in which you can do works of love. But he is focused on the way in which what is essential um, what is essential has to do with God being a part of those works. God is the core and an enabler of those works of love. It is God that enables us to do works, to act uh, in our world with others out of God's love, out of out of Christian love, and not merely romantic, poetic, or familial love. Now, next, I want to uh, bring to mind that he begins with an opening prayer. Um, and I'm, I realize I'm spending a bit of time in the beginning here, because I think starting off, these are things that people often just ignore, or just sort of throw out. They don't, they just kind of, if they read them at all, they just kind of go, shoop, whatever. These are really important in understanding what he's doing here. Because for him, the source of love, as one tries to love, he's Lutheran, so as one tries to love without the presence of God in one's love, one fails. The only way one can truly love is to have God present and be the director, be the source, 
and be the one who gives an example and to be the one who is present witnessing that. And so he begins with a prayer in his in the opening. And this is the case for your book as well. How could love be rightly discussed if you were forgotten, O oh God? For the Princeton version, let me read it to you because I think it's worth reflecting upon. And I encourage you to note the three, the Trinitarian structure of it. How could we speak properly about love if you were forgotten? You, God of love, source of all love in heaven on earth, you who spared nothing but in love gave everything, you who are love, so that one who loves is what he is only by being in you. Now, this prayer here, this is, the, this is a key to understanding what he's getting at in his approach. God is the source of the, our ability to love. Ontologically, from the beginning, and in every individual situation and, and occurrence of love. I continue. How could one speak properly about love if you were forgotten? You who revealed what love is, our Savior and Redeemer, who gave yourself in order to save all. How could we speak of love, the exemplar of the work of love in sacrifice to neighbor? How could we speak properly of love if you were forgotten? Spirit of love, who take nothing of your own, but remind us of that self-sacrifice of love. And thirdly, O eternal love, you are everywhere present, witnessing, or you are never without witness where you are called upon. Be not without witness in what will be said here about love or about the works of love. There are indeed only some works that human life, human language, specifically and narrowly calls the works of love. But in heaven, no work can be pleasing unless it is a work of love. Sincere in self-renunciation, the need uh, in love itself, for that very reason without any claim of meritocracy, of meritousness. Now, I... I raise that without any claim of meritousness because what he's putting forth here, even though some folks have argued that this is an ethics, this isn't about ethics. Now, it might be about Christian ethics because Christian ethics are different than ethics in Kierkegaard's mind. Christian ethics are about putting God forth and putting God first and enabling us to act out of love, in love, through the source of love, which is God. Ethics requires us to behave in certain ways that follow rational and reasonable and universal norms. That is to treat everyone with the kind of respect that they are accorded as humans. I would suggest we add birds and other creatures in there as well. But that's a matter of secular ethics, a discussion about that. How do we treat others? Christian ethics is not about treating others with respect merely, but about loving them. So I encourage you to reflect upon that. You'll notice the Trinitarian structure that God is the power by which we are enabled to love, the source, the power, the source. Um, God is also the example of how we should love our neighbors. And God is the spirit of wisdom that guides us in that love and receives that love. Now, um, I encourage you to take a moment and look over this uh, book, right? So that's kind of an introduction. I just wanted to give you an introduction. If you want to stop it here and go over and reread some of the material, that would be fine. Um, but if you're ready to continue, I'm ready to continue. So for Kierkegaard, 
love is hidden. It is more like it is um, down here rather than the fruit uh, or the leaves um, or even the trunk. It is even the root is our root. The source of love is even more deeply within us. Kierkegaard engages the metaphor of a tree to understand Christian love. The leaves are the words. We can say, I love you. We can say, I want to do good for you. We can say, I need, um, uh, I, I want to help you do blah, blah, blah. Or you, we can say words that are actually, can be consoling to persons, can be helpful. Um, but they can be confused. They can be insufficient. They can even be deceiving. I guess he knew a little bit about politics. The works of love are thus recognized not merely by the fruit, by the flowers, but by the fruits. So now the fruits are what comes from the work that we've done. They don't just look good, but do they taste good? Right? The true life and source of love is hidden as the roots of the giant sequoia are unseen. And that is our relationship with God. They are deep within the earth, deep within ourselves, the roots of divine love in our relationship with God. The roots are fed, fed by the mysterious deep spring of love and God's eternal love. That's his metaphor for talking about how love, love's life is hidden. It's hard to know whether or not someone is actually loving or doing the works of love. It's even hard to know if we are doing the works of love. We might think we're doing the works of love, but are we truly? And that's where part of what he's getting at is this book is meant to help us reflect upon are the things that we're doing actually works of love. Love springs from the hidden mystery. Love proceeds from the heart. But let us not in haste forget about this, forget that the eternal love, the eternal truth that love forms the heart. Now, this is on, excuse me, on page 29 in your, in your book. Excuse me. So I encourage you to go ahead and look at page 29 on, in your book and look at the text and look at how he talks about, uh, where he talks about this. I think you'll find it uh, this section of the of the of the book really helpful. It forms our heart. This is at the bottom of the page on page twenty nine. If love is really to bear fruit and consequently to be recognized by its fruit, it must form a heart. And love proceeds from this heart. For eternal love is what forms that heart. So think about this, this, the flow of this love. This love is formed by God and it flows upward and outward. I encourage you to go back to page 27. So this section, God loves hidden life and the recognize, it's recognizable by it. its fruits is an important one. So I encourage you to read that over a couple of times. The hidden life of love in the most inward depths is, infall is infathomable. And it has an infallible relationship with the whole of existence. And it all begins in God's love. So please reread those few pages and reflect upon what that means and how that relates to your understanding of love. My hope is that love is perhaps one of your core values, um, your core claims about who God is. I've asked you to take a look at your core values and to reflect upon those, as well as your embedded theological assumptions and your deliberative claims about who God is, who we are, and what we are to do. 
I, my hope is that love is involved in that in that claim. Now here is a summary of the whole book that or not the whole book, but a summary of the the material that we are going to be reading, which is the foundation of the, the whole book. And we will begin with uh, we, we'll talk about this is section two. So we'll talk about three different sections. The first one, uh, oh wait, this is just the summary. So there's the summary first. So the summary is that God is the source of love. God enables us to love. Now, if you think about that, you might say, okay, yeah, God enables us to love. But that means that if we rely upon God to enable us to love, then the love that we're sharing is a kind of divine love. It's not merely our own desire or our own preference that we're sharing. Through God, through loving God first. So for Kierkegaard, God is the source of love, and thus we must love God first. Before we try to love the other, we love God first. And that is what enables us to love our neighbor. It enables us to focus our attention and our love toward the neighbor and not merely toward that which we are that person or that type of person that we are embedded to love or we 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 prefer to love because of our embedded assumptions perhaps because of our own um, particularities in terms of our desires or our interests you know the type you know what do you what kinds of girls or boys do you like or what kinds of birds do you like um, for me it's birds well I like a lot of things um, but it is my preference that I'm really loving. I'm loving someone who has pretty eyes, or I'm loving someone who's kind to me, or I'm loving someone who's got a sweet chirp. Um, it's not loving that person or that entity for themselves. It's loving them because of my preference. So Kierkegaard is trying to help us understand that that is that's kind of a love that's coming from us, and thus it is a little stunted, right? It's not really the love that's coming from God that is enabled when we love God first. Our faith in God is what connects us with the empowerment that enables us to fulfill this command to love, which is a duty, this command to love. God is also the example for us to imitate. I mean, we want to know, okay, I, I'm willing to love my neighbor. How do I do that? How do I know what my neighbor needs? How do I get over my own prejudice or my own biases in terms of who I love and who do I give money to or who do I, who do I help or who do I um, give uh, primacy to? Loving the neighbor is hard and it's confusing. What does loving a particular neighbor mean? How do I love this? How do I express that love to that person? Do I paint pictures for them? Do I give them gifts? Do I get their mail? Do I bring their garbage can in? Do I tell them I love them? What does it mean? Um, and I, 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 Kierkegaard will talk a little bit about the way in which Jesus is an example for us to love. That Jesus shows love by healing and welcoming the stranger, welcoming those who are outcast, taking care of those who everyone else ignores, letting the children come to him, talking to women. All the people... Um, and creatures that the society says aren't as important as the others. He tells us great stories of love. He tells us about the Good Samaritan. He tells us uh, when he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. And who is your neighbor? And he tells the story of the great, of the Samaritan. Now, on the one hand, who should you love? The Samaritan. Samaritan was somebody who was despised and not and not trusted in that time. Um, 
And yet the Samaritan is the one who gives the example of showing love by taking care of the needs of the person in need. Jesus has encouraged us to imitate that, to look for the person in need and to care for them, to be aware of the one that we run into that is in need and to do what it is they need. Who's the outcast? Who's the looked down upon? How can we show compassion for others? People maybe we don't like. You might come up, uh, come up with an example of love and someone who loves from your own experience. Maybe someone from your family. Maybe um, a saint or someone you think um, of as a great example. I think of Mr. Rogers. I, um, I like Mr. Rogers in terms of the values that he ascribes and how he talks about loving our neighbors and treating people in ways of respect and kindness. I also suggest um, that one of the ways that we can be loving is to follow something that a Jewish teacher teaches us named Hillel. And Hillel is a little, uh, maybe a hundred years before Jesus, Jesus's time. And what he says is similar to what Jesus says in terms of love your neighbor as yourself, uh, which is very um, grounded in the Hebrew scriptures. But Hillel suggests that the way that we uh, engage that is to not do to others what is harmful to us. And I, I like the way that he gives us as that guide, because sometimes um, the, the other way of saying it, the way that we usually hear it said from Jesus is to whatever um, you want, um, you know, how you want to be treated, treat neighbor, your neighbors that way, or treat the other that way. Um, and what he says is, what's harmful to others or hateful to you, don't do. And I think that's in some ways a little more inclusive, because what I might want might not be what you want. Uh, you know, we might find that out here. It's it's just after Christmas here when I'm making this video. You know, what I would want for Christmas is not necessarily what the boyfriend would want for Christmas. And I don't know, sometimes people get each other things that they want um, instead of what the other person actually wants or might want. Uh, and so I think it's helpful what, what he's saying is try to put yourself in the other person's shoe. And the thing that was more universal is to not do things that are harmful to each other. Um, and I encourage us to let prayer and wisdom guide us for each individual neighbor that we're called to love and to reflect upon what it is that individual neighbor might need, which may be different than what we need. And the third point I'd like to highlight in the summary of works of love is also Trinitarian. I mean, it finishes the Trinitarian claim here, is that God is the power by which we know we are loved as well. God is the ever-present reminder of our beloved status as well. We are loved. And we are to love just as we are loved. So you are a neighbor to yourself as well. God loves you. Now, another point I want to make, and this is another important point as you're reading this, it's called upbuilding love. Love is upbuilding for Kierkegaard. That means that it is already, upbuilding means something is already there. You're building something up. You're not building from nothing. You're not building from the ground. You're building from a foundation. And here's a good way of thinking about what Kierkegaard is saying in Christian love. Christian love presumes that God is already present in each neighbor, in each individual. God is present in you. God is present in me. God is already present. And if God is already present, then I am already enabled to love. You are already enabled to love. You are already lovable. I am already lovable. And this is particularly important because many times our neighbors do not seem to us to be lovable or to be able to love. I mean, able to love us 
or others. And that's where we find ourselves in trouble, I think, when we think of others, neighbors, whether they be like us or not like us, whether they be um, what we would call as foreigners or alien or um, people from a different culture, whether they be in this country or they whether they be in a different country, whether they be uh, Christian or whether they be non-Christian. God is present in each individual already enabling love, already loving and all, already enabling love. So upbuilding love presumes that love is already present. The neighbor is already deserving of love before we come onto the scene. The neighbor is also already capable of love. So treat the neighbor as someone who's already capable of love, not someone that just need, merely needs your help, but also someone who can help. Not merely someone that you are giving charity to, but someone who is not only deserving of kindness and celebration, but also someone who is a subject capable of divine love. Love sees love. It's almost like for Kierkegaard, Christian love puts on special Christian love glasses. Where's some glasses? I don't know where my heart glasses. Oh, they're in my other thing. I need to put those on. Christian love glasses that enables us to see the love that is hidden like the deep spring that feeds the tree's roots. So now here's the structure of the book. So those are pretty core claims I've made. And if you, if you don't quite get them or they don't, haven't quite hit you, I encourage you to go back and reread the section or rewatch the video. This is the structure of the book, right? The first section that we're going to be reading in section, well, the section 2A, the first section we're going to be reading is you shall love. The, this commandment to love is what structures the material that we're reading from Kierkegaard. The second section we're going to, he's going to talk about what it means for love to be a duty. What does it mean to say that I am commanded by God to love? I am not only commanded by God to love, but God's love and God's presence in me is what enables me to love, enables me to fulfill that commandment. Two, you shall love your neighbor. So the second section that we're going to be reading is, who's your neighbor? How do you know who your neighbor is? Is your neighbor the one that is next door to you? Is the neighbor the one that's like you? Is the neighbor merely the people in your neighborhood? Or is it everyone you meet? Is it uh, Crosby, Steels, and Nash? Love the one you're with? Or is it go out and find the one you can love? So many love songs are about, I've been looking for you everywhere. Where are you? I want to love you. Where the one, where's the one for me to love? Where can I find you? Looking for love in all the wrong places. Or is love about something that comes from you, not necessarily tied to the type of object, but rather loving the one that you're with, loving the one that you see. Then the third section we're going to be focused on is you shall love your neighbor. How you, who is you that is doing the loving? How does that love impact you? How does it change you? How does it, how do you know that you are actually doing the loving? And we'll talk about each of those as we go forward. So here's the first section. You shall love. Love is a command. So now reflect upon what it means to have a command. A command means that it is a uh, legal term. It's an imperative. Shall is a legal term. Um, those of you who have taken any classes from Scott C know that shall is, is not will. 
Um, he uh, reminds us in the faculty meeting all the time when we're looking at the faculty handbook, it says, this shall happen. It means that is an imperative. It doesn't mean this is something that's supposed to happen. It means this shall happen. This is imperative that it happens, not just sometimes, but all the time. And there's a particular term that is used if it's happened sometimes and not all the time, but shall means this is an imperative. It's supposed to happen all the time, should happen all the time. If it doesn't, something is amiss. So you shall love, it's an imperative, it's command. You are enabled and commanded to love. The love of neighbor follows from the great commandment, which is the first commandment. You shall love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and might. Um, you might recall Tillich's understanding of faith here, which is about love, which is the ultimate concern, which is about loving God with all of your being. And that center, that love, that, 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 that center of yourself that's loving God is the same center we're talking about, um, that ultimate concern that that centers you and brings you together in relation to God. Self, proper self-love is about loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, this includes loving yourself properly, not more or less, but as yourself. So loving yourself is important as well, treating yourself with respect and letting, and letting yourself know that God loves you and that you are capable of love. This is a command. This is what God commands us, to know that we are enabled to love. We are not only commanded to love, we're enabled to love because God is present with, within us. God is the source of our being. God is at the center, loving us. It's like we have, um, we have the sun within us, literally, S-U-N and S-O-N, so to speak. Loving yourself and loving your neighbor properly are both empowered by your relationship with God. Now, I encourage you to uh, take a moment and reflect upon the last paragraph of pages 56 and the first area, the first part of 57. And I encourage you to just take a moment, take a few, stop the recording here and read it over. See what you think it means. <laughs> 